I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference. It's been wonderful. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some ongoing work that um, I have with uh, my postdoc, Laurie Stevenson, who's sitting over there. Um, and and the, the motivation for it is that we have um, whole genome sequence polymorphism data from all the great ape species uh, except mountain gorillas. And uh, we are, in general, interested in using that data to uh, understand something about how um, fine scale and broad scale recombination rates uh, change over time. And uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about, though. Um, because uh, uh, although we've had that data for uh, two years, uh, <laughs> There's been some, some problems in, in, in our data analysis, um, and, and that's partly what I'm going to talk about, is just um, sort of our difficulties in, in actually being able to detect these recombination hotspots. Uh, so first, a little biological background. Uh, so so we're, we're going to be dealing with recombination, which is a fundamental biological process, at least um, in diploids. Um, in meiosis, you know, we have we have pairs of homologous chromosomes, and, and recombination is a process that, generally speaking, um, produces um, mosaic um, descendant chromosomes from these pair of homologous chromosomes. And there are different models for how that happens. The standard one is is one where you have a double strand break in one chromosome, and there's some kind of strand migration, and that junction there moves around a bit. And then it gets resolved. And it can get resolved, at least in the standard model, in two different ways. Um, one that's, that's generally termed a crossover, um, which involves sort of the, the reciprocal transfer of a large stretch of DNA. So you can see this descendant chromosome has a large bunch of red over here. Um, or it could involve um, something that we term a gene conversion, which is, is sort of a a non-reciprocal <laughs> transfer of a small amount of DNA from one homologous chromosome to another. So um, we actually don't model it exactly, but the standard way of modeling it just involves um, sort of a, a ignoring certain patchworks that happen and assuming that crossovers are simple crossovers without associated gene conversion and a separate gene conversion event. Um, and I'll just say that as background because actually I'm not going to talk about gene conversion at all. I'm going to uh, assume, for the moment at least, that we're dealing with recombination just as these crossovers. Okay. And so there, there are a lot of reasons why we might be interested in recombination. Um, some of the standard ones are um, over very long periods of time. It's thought that recombination is important for the maintenance of sex. Um, it, and it, it improves the efficacy of natural selection. Um, in, a, in a more mechanistic sense, it seems like it's necessary for proper segregation of chromosomes in meiosis. And in, in the human genetics world, recombination is important because it's, it's the prime determinant of, of the patterns of linkage disequilibrium that we expect to observe and, and the structure, sorry, the structure of genetic variation across the genome. Um, that may become a little less important as as human genetics moves towards sequencing studies as opposed to um, you know, SNP-based association studies. But at least for now, um, understanding something about the patterns of linkage disequilibrium is, has applications <laughs> both in evolutionary and human genetics. So, so there are different ways that we have of, of estimating recombination rates. And this is kind of, I'd say, analogous to um, what what Molly talked about yesterday dealing with mutation rates. There are direct ways of measuring recombination rates that involve looking at pedigrees um, or sperm typing studies. Um, and and these, these methods can provide estimates of, of recombination in specific individuals in very recent generations. Um, and uh, the other approach is, is sort of an indirect way. And it's based on patterns of linkage disequilibrium. And you can think of this as, as a method that, that really is averaging over lots of individuals over evolutionary timescales, so one to two million years over both 
sexes in many, many generations. And we generally quantify that, that indirect estimate of recombination using this compound parameter rho, which is four times the effective population size times the recombination rate. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's this compound parameter because actually the LD patterns cannot be used to estimate either the actual recombination rate or the population size individually. Okay, so I think you probably all know what linkage disequilibrium is, but I'll just sort of put up this basic cartoon to remind myself and you uh, that, that linkage disequilibrium is just some way of, of quantifying the, the, the non-random association of alleles at different sites. So here, the cartoon has each, uh, each row consists of like a, a two-site haplotype at a different chromosome. So you can think of, uh, you know, in this example, low linkage disequilibrium um, is equivalent to um, cases where you have no association between alleles at the first site or the second site. High linkage disequilibrium means you have some kind of correlation. Here, they're completely correlated that if you have an A allele at the first site, you always have a C at the second. Um, and, and so the, the basic thought is that um, in general, the higher your recombination rate, the lower the level of linkage disequilibrium that you observe. And, and conversely, the less recombination you have, in general, the higher the level of linkage disequilibrium that you observe. Um, there's, there's a lot of variability in that, though, um, and, and that's what makes things somewhat challenging. Um, the other challenging thing is that LD, at least as it's defined here, deals with pairs of sites, and, and we're interested in, in recombination across the whole genome, and, and that rate may, may vary in an arbitrarily complex manner. Okay, so, so what we do know, at least in humans, um, recombination rates do vary across um, regions of the genome. They vary between males and females systematically. Um, and even within individuals of the same gender, um, there are systematic differences in recombination rates. Um, further, in, in humans, we know that, and this has been uh, touched upon by, by previous speakers, recombination rates are not uniform. So they vary, and they vary in a sort of a specific way where actually most recombination events happen in a very small fraction of the sequence. Okay. Um, and it's, it's generally thought that, that um, the two different classes of methods for estimating recombination rates are generally concordant. So pedigree-based methods versus sperm typing versus linkage to equilibrium based methods generally give the same answer. Um, so here's, here's a, an early study by, by Gill and colleagues um, where they looked in the MHC region, estimated recombination using, um, using patterns in linkage to equilibrium, and that's in red, and they compared it with uh, estimates of recombination from sperm typing, which are in blue. And uh, you know, e even though the the y-axis is on a log, log on, a, on a log scale. You can squint your eyes, and, and the, they line up pretty well. Okay, so much better than some of us thought they would, but they, they actually do line up. But I will say that um, when you look at the scale here, um, we're dealing with several orders of magnitude difference in recombination rate, and this is not normal for the whole genome. Um, so there are actually only a few regions where you expect this sort of thousand-fold difference in recombination. It's, it's more typically, let's say, 10 or 20 or 50-fold differences um, between background recombination rates and hotspots. Okay, so, um, so another study that um, involved several of the audience members here um, looked at recombination rate variation in chimpanzees um, using patterns in linkage to equilibrium. And and they concluded that, that chimpanzees have recombination hotspots, but in different locations from human hotspots. And how they did this is they, they had a way of, of estimating the locations of different hotspots, and they looked at the, the, the estimate of rho, the, the scale of recombination rate. At, so in panel A here, they have, um, they have superimposed 
the locations of many chimp hotspots and looked at the estimate of recombination rate in the orthologous regions in humans. And you can see that those lines here are flat. So, so that locations where there are chimp hotspots do not seem to have elevated recombination rate estimates in humans. And conversely, here are the locations of estimated hotspots in humans. And there does not seem to be any uh, elevated recombination rate estimate in chimpanzees at those locations. Okay, so that, that's what we think we know. Um, and, and maybe I'll also try to clarify that, that there, are, there are one set of methods out there for estimating recombination rates across large regions. Um, and Gil was a pioneer in this. So Yoon has done some work in this too. Um, but those, those methods in general do not quantify the uncertainty in their estimates. So if your particular interest well, as mine is right now, for identifying um, those specific regions where recombination rates are high, that we call these recombination hotspots, you need a sort of a separate methodology um, for, for, for identifying them in some kind of statistical or quantitative framework. OK, so there are several methods out there for detecting these hotspots. Um, these are the main ones. Uh, they all, in, in practice, they actually all involve some kind of approximation to, to likelihood. Um, so, so we might know what we want to do in theory to estimate recombination rates under a full likelihood model. But those are, in practice, actually not feasible, computationally feasible. And I, I use computationally feasible in a pretty loose sense in that um, it turns out like actually only one of these methods can estimate hotspots in what across a whole genome in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And reasonable in this case means 100 years of computational time. Okay, so we're not talking, I mean, so if you're just working on your desktop computer, you're out of luck. Um, so th these are, as of now, extremely computationally <coughs> intensive. And, and partly because of that, um, they haven't been well tested. So the, the next fastest of these, um, so there's a composite likelihood version of, of infer row that um, Bruce Rinala developed that we estimate would take maybe 15 times longer, like 1,500 years of compu computing time. So that's um, not feasible now, maybe feasible in a few years. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the, the basic structure of, of the method that people use is LD hot. And, and for background, it's based on a composite likelihood approach that was developed by Dick Hudson, um, published in 2001, where, where the idea is, is reasonably simple. So here's sort of a, a representation of some sequence data. Each, each line, again, is a, a haplotype. Each column is a, a different variable site, a SNP. Um, and, and the idea is that if we wanted to estimate the, so, so that, you know, in general, the goal might be to take a data set, this whole data set, and estimate the likelihood of observing that data um, as a function of an underlying recombination rate, even a, a, a single rate or multiple rates or whatever. Um, and, and so that turns out to be extremely difficult to do computationally. And so Dick Hudson's idea was to break up your data set into smaller regions where the problem is a little easier. And in, in particular, you can break it up into pairs of sites. And so there, there's, there are ways of calculating the, the likelihood function um, for a particular you know, um, set of data of, of, of haplotypes like this. Um, pretty much, you, know, you can calculate it exactly. Um, four pairs of sites as a function of the recombination rate. Um, and so, um, so Hudson's approach is to take not just one pair, but every single pair of sites and, and form a composite likelihood by just multiplying the likelihoods of, of each pair of sites. And un, under this composite likelihood, then you can, you can maximize the composite likelihood as a function of, of the underlying recombination rate. 
So that's the basic idea. So is he taking the distance along the chromosome in the image? Yeah, so, so his approach was to assume that the recombination rate is constant across base pairs. And so you're looking, you, you need the exact locations too, because you're assuming, um, so you're estimating over a, a rate per base pair. And so then each pair of sites has a different distance. And so then, you know, if you're estimating your rate per base pair, it, it corresponds to a different genetic distance between each pair of sites. So it's alignment. Yes. So in in in. So this is assuming you have full sequence data, essentially. Um, okay. So here's here's sort of a one potential implementation of LD hot. Um, that was used to analyze the chimpanzee data. Uh, and and the, the basic idea is you, you take your whole genome, you take sort of a sliding window approach. And so they, they used a, a 200 KB size window. Um, and they wanted to ask, is there a recombination hotspot in the center of that 200 KB window? Um, so they constructed a composite likelihood um, using this, the same Hudson-like approach um, under a model where there's a background recombination rate that's constant and a putative hotspot, elevated hotspot rate in the central 2KB. Um, they calculated a li likelihood ratio test statistic, um, comparing that maximum likelihood with, with a comparable one under a model with no recombination rate variation. And then they estimated the significance, uh, I mean, since you're dealing with composite likelihood, um, they had to estimate the significance of anything observed um, by simulation. So they ran a bunch of simulations um, to sort of get a p-value attached with whether there seemed to be, you know, a hot spot in a particular location. Um, some filtering steps down at the bottom, and then they shift over their whole window 1KB and, and do the same thing again. So you can think that, you know, they're breaking up their genome into, you know, millions of these 200 KB windows, doing a, a simple kind of analysis, estimating p-value, and, and moving on to the next one. So, um, so actually, it's, it's step three here that takes all the time. Okay, so, so calculating the likelihood ratio test statistic is, is not that long. Um, but they, to estimate the significance of it, they were running many, many simulations and doing the same kind of analysis, and that's, that's what takes up all the time. Okay, so what have people done? And so maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm only aware of, of three studies that what I would sort of view as systematic that looked for hotspots across the whole genome. And those Studies um, included humans, chimpanzees, and Arabidopsis. Um, and all three studies used, used LD-HOT. Um, you know, th there's some study of hotspots across the dog genome, but it's based on pretty low coverage SNP data, uh, low density SNP data. There's one in Drosophila that, that you and colleagues did. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was you just looked at specific regions for hotspots and did not actually survey the whole genome. Um, hopefully, I, I'm not misspeaking on that front. Um, okay, so so our our general question is, well, how good is LD Hot at detecting true recombination hotspots? And there's some challenge to determining this because um, LD Hot is is not actually publicly available, and um, its three instances of use all use different methodology, so it's not clear to what extent. Those are different from each other. And if you actually wanted to compare different methods, you're still stuck with a problem that is very computationally intensive. So as I said, um, more than 100 years of, of CPU time. OK. So, so we started by trying to implement LD-HOT. Um, and and we, we did it in a way similar to what Simon did many years ago. Um, and, and we modified it slightly, at least to um, for for the sort of running the null simulations um, for estimating significance values. 
we ran simulations and we stored the results into some very large table and, and used them to sort of estimate significance for all potential hotspot locations across the genome simultaneously. And, and you can, I mean, I guess roughly speaking, I think the previous approach used like a parametric bootstrap approach where for each particular region, they're running simulations based on estimated values. Um, and and we're, we're essentially taking a flat prior where we, we are uniform prior. We're assuming, you know, we run simulations assuming drawing um, mutation and recombination rates from some uniform distribution and hoping that that covers the whole range of what we actually are going to observe in data. We can, the, the point of this is that then we can, we can run it once, store some huge amount of, of, of simulations and reuse them in however we want to. And so then it gives us the this, this speed up so that we can actually see how well the method is doing. Okay, so that's a basic thought. I mean, the methodology does differ a little bit. Um, we looked at the, the regions identified as hotspots in the CHIMP study um, and calculated sort of the median p-value that we observed there compared with the median p-value for 1 kb away or 2 kb away or whatever. Um, I don't know whether to be happy with, with this result or not, but um, at least in general, we find a dip in the p-value where we're supposed to, but our estimate of the median p-value is actually higher than 0 0.01, so we're not actually recovering the same thing that they, they get. Um, but at least it, it shows that we're doing at least something that's vaguely similar. Do you start with rates that LD hat estimated? Do you start with regions where LD hat um, estimated a high rate? For, for this? Or? These, are, these are the exact. So these are exactly the locations. I see, these are the exact locations. The exact locations and as close as we could get to the exact data set that was analyzed. It, uh, Adam's actually not sure which version it was. So. Did, did you try Adam's implementation? It's not publicly available. It's not privately available. <laughs> it's not available. So the answer is no. Um, uh, I have no reason to believe what Adam did is wrong. I, I'm just saying we made a couple different decisions about how to, how to do things that Completely. speeded it up that obviously can change things a little bit. Um, okay, so, so then we tried to run some simulations that you can think of them as roughly appropriate for great apes. Um, so we, we started with 30 haploid sequences because we have 15 lowland gorillas that we wanted to analyze. Um, and we simulated um, smallish regions, 300 kb regions, that had a single hotspot in the center that was, um, had an elevated rate that ranged from 10 times to 100 times the background rate. We assumed a background rate of 0 0.001 per base pair um, for both the recombination rate and mutation rate. We've run simulations with other values. Um, they don't actually make that much of a difference. Uh, and uh, so to, to make the analysis sort of comparable, uh, instead of choosing a single p-value and, and doing some kind of filtering, we, we chose a different strategy where we would choose the p-value so that the false positive rate was roughly the same across simulations under different parameter values. And we, we set that as some arbitrary, you know, half a percent. Can I ask a question? Sure. Rate as the background, and you might think you want to pick the median given the hot spotty nature of the genome. So, are you claiming that if I made it five or ten times lower, it wouldn't make a difference? It makes very little difference. Actually, shockingly little. I, I don't. I don't quite understand that. I've, I've run them as low as um, whatever rate Bruce Rinala uses, which I think is six times ten to the minus five per base pair. It makes a slight difference. Um, I have some thought, I mean, I can talk to you offline about this. I have some thoughts as to why that might be. Um, okay, so, so that actually brings up an important point. These simulations are meant to be 
Okay, so simulations that, that have been done before took an optimistic case. Okay, so they said, okay, well, let's look at the MHC region and assume that's normal. And we assume a very low background rate and a very, very high hotspot rate and looked at power for detecting a hotspot where the, you know, the hotspot rate is like 700 times the background rate. Um, that's not so normal. Um, we took the opposite strategy, at least at the start, where this is a, a somewhat more pessimistic view. So you can think of the scaled background rate. What, what Molly is saying is essentially the scaled background rate or recombination for much of the genome will be less than 0 0.001 per base pair. That's true. We've done some simulations for half of this and one-tenth of that as well. Um, okay. Uh, we also employed a, a minor allele frequency cutoff of 0.05. Um, there's, there's some reason for doing that that I'll talk about later. Okay, so here's the power um, to detect a 10-fold hotspot, 20-fold, 50-fold, and 100-fold. So you can think of this for regions of the genome that are not, not optimal. And the power is not optimal. It ranges from 6% to maybe 15%. And uh, so when you, when, you look at, when you look at what's going on, um, one thing that becomes clear is that LDHOT has difficulty determining what I would say the specific location of a hotspot. So it, it may sort of think that there's a hotspot somewhere, but it can't figure out exactly where it is. And, and I think qualitatively, that's due to the, the nature of the composite likelihood used. So you can think of it as it's, it's looking at all pairs of sites within a, a 200 kV window. And you're trying to find those sites that have some information about just the central 2 kV and the surrounding area. So you have a question? Yeah, biologically, like how wide do we think a hotspot really would be? Like it, I mean, it seems doubtful that it would really be just one specific base, right? Um, I think biologically it's on the order of a few hundred base pairs to a couple kb in length. So 2 kb might be on the large side. Um, but it's, it's, so when you're saying specific here, you're meaning within 2 kb? I, I guess what I mean by specific, it has difficulty determining where the hotspot is to within 10 kb, let's say. Oh, okay. okay. And the reason why it can't figure that out is because it's looking over a 200 kb window. And most of the pairs of sites that are used for this composite likelihood are totally uninformative about that. So they may be both on one side, for example, or they may be 150 kb apart. And it's very hard to figure out where a hotspot's going to be in the center because you're only looking at, you know, you only have information about, you know, two sites that are very far apart. Okay. Um, so, and the, so your power wasn't about whether you detect a hotspot anywhere. It was about whether you detect it in the right spot. So, okay, yes, so, so this power is for, for the locations that actually were hot in, in the simulated data, what proportion of them were identified as hotspots in the simulations? But was that, if it was the time window, if there was any hotspot, or whether you were in a certain distance? Uh, How does it define the power? The power is defined as the probability of, of a particular base pair that's actually a hotspot being called as a hotspot. Okay, so if, so if you identify a hotspot that includes half of the true location, then that half, it counts as 50% power. And if there's some part of your hotspot identified that's somewhere else, then that counts it in, towards your false positive rate. But the okay. window is 1,000 base pairs, the call. Your call is at the resolution of 1,000 base pairs, yes. Yeah, so I mean, in, in this case, you know, either you're calling it, so there's a 2 kb hotspot, you can call it exactly, you can call it halfway, or you can not call it at all. Jeff, maybe you're going to get there, but um, so if in practice, so if you're worried about the dilution effect of picking a too large a window, I guess there mm -hmm. are two things that immediately spring to mind. One is if you've tried weighting the different pairs differently, and the second is what if you start with regions that are identified as hot using LD hat, how much does that help since that has narrower resolution? Okay. Um, yes, we have worked on weighting things. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, 
And uh, I'll get to LD Hat as well. If, if I haven't answered your question, okay. maybe uh, you can remind me. Um, yes? I just wanted to get a sense of, well, I kind of understand the issue of resolution, but we kind of, when we did simulations of power all those years ago, I think we counted it as a success if we had evidence that, say, a, a p-value of less than 0.01 at the center. And then the resolution issue, I guess, we thought was something we would just wear. As in, you know, we knew it. We, we had only one SIP for 5kb in. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I think obviously your power calculations were different because you had SNP data. And that was, in part, the reason why you took 200 kb windows. Right. You couldn't take a 10 kb window because you, you had no data. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, I, I've tried to talk mostly about the, the chimp data because it's comparable in the sense that it's, it's whole genome data. There, there's very dense SNPs. Um, but in, in that particular case, because uh, you know, the specific method they used is, well, they're having this problem, and so they, they deal with it by cutting out regions that they, if the region looks like a hotspot that's too large, they throw it out. Okay, so that, that's, that's the, the Otten et al. approach, as you probably know, since you're an author. Um, <laughs> and, and my only point is just, you know, if your goal is to say, okay, well, are you getting a low p-value where you're supposed to? That, yeah, you do a lot better, but, but that's not the whole question. The question is, if you're, if you're trying to actually analyze data and identify hotspots using some criteria, can you do a good job of that? I think that's quite like, I, I'm just trying to sort of tell how much is it about knowing there's some hot region, and how much is it about knowing exactly where it is. And I think I agree that the second one's harder. Okay. We do, we do always use LD hat. Okay, so let me. We always had to use LD hat to do the best at that, but we still don't do. Okay. Terribly well. Uh, hopefully, I'll get at that, in in a couple slides. Here's one example. So let's say let's say you do the same analysis, but you change your window size. Okay, and so now instead of a 200 kb window, you take a 100 kb window, or a 50 kb window, or a 20 kb window. Um, this is how your power changes. And, and I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is it's, it shouldn't be too surprising that your power increases when you have a smaller window size. Um, because you're, you're sort of, and, and this implicitly is, is a very simple weighting scheme. It says if your SNPs are too far apart, zero. the weight is zero. <laughs> Otherwise, the weight is one. Um, we've played with other weights. Um, and, uh, you know, for, so, okay, so even though we've speeded these things up, you know, these simulations are still like, you know, it takes us a while. We only have like 500 examples for each of these cases. It's kind of slow. We can increase our power slightly, but I don't know if I believe it. Yeah. Do you condition on having exactly one hotspot? Or could you have many? Uh, you can have many hotspots. You can have many hotspots, okay. Yeah. And when you're analyzing the data, you well, know in nothing. These simulations in these simulations. So that so you the could truth have zero, or you could have five, or you could yes, have yes. Okay. So one point is smaller window sizes make more sense if you have sequence data. Um, you know, another thing that can speed things up is to throw out low frequency variants. So we looked at well, what happens if you throw out like all rare variants? Rare in this case defined as five percent or less minor low frequency. I don't know. There's not much difference. Um, so. In general, there's, there's, uh, this is good, not just because it speeds things up, but because those rare variants are exactly the class of variants that have the highest error rate in, in sequencing studies. Uh, so, so it's thought that there's going to be a substantial um, false negative rate where there are a lot of singletons that are being missed. Um, and in addition, you know, the ones that are called are somewhat arbitrary. The, the amount of evidence for them being there is not always very strong if, if, you, if you don't have extremely high coverage data. Okay, so um, we've run a couple other simulations. Uh, also, not surprisingly, if you uh, look at different sample sizes, your power generally increases when your sample size increases. Um, and so I think the, the point is, well, power is pretty low when you only have 
20 chromosomes, so that would be the equivalent of 10 individuals. Um, but just moving it from 10 to like 18 makes a huge difference. Um, it really increases your power a lot. Um, we've run other simulations, but I mean. It doesn't look like a huge difference. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think my sense is when you're that low, like any, any amount that you increase is great. I mean, you know, percentage-wise, you're increasing your power by, let's say, 30%. 30%. That's pretty good. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, when you're starting pretty low, like 30%, I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, I mean, so we're running a little more simulations. I mean, I think my, my basic thought without knowing yet is that essentially things work well in humans because you can keep on extrapolating this curve until you deal with like 60 individuals or something and then it's, you know, n of 120 it's going to be a lot better than it is, um, you know, with just 10. Um, okay, so, so we looked, at, we, we started looking briefly whether a different method would, would do better. Um, and I, I started with something that was extremely easy to implement. Um, so a, a method of convenience, not for any particular um, true biological or statistical reason. So we looked at a, a, a sort of replacing um, the Hudson, the, the underlying Hudson composite likelihood with a summary likelihood approach, where where you sort of take data and you you calculate some summary statistics on it. In this case, the number of segregating sites, the number of distinct haplotypes, and the minimum number of inferred recombination events, and then using a simulation-based likelihood scheme where you estimate the likelihood of observed data as a function of, of the recombination rate, and, and a similar kind of likelihood ratio test comparing a central 2KB window with some kind of region on the side. And the, the specific details don't matter because we just chose arbitrary ones, um, at least at the start. And at least in some cases, you can increase your power significantly. Well, significantly as in it's greater than zero increase. But <laughs> now, importantly, maybe not, but, but significantly, yes. Um, we also looked at this, uh, this infer row, which, which is the closest thing to an implementation that sort of incorporates this full likelihood that we think we might want to do. Um, the, the implementation that's available has low power and extremely low false positive rate. Um, so it's good for something. It's like if it calls a hotspot, you're pretty sure it's a hotspot. Um, but it's not going to call very many of them. Um, so there's a chance if, if, if you tinker with the code, you might be able to get some improvement. But, but I'll still have a caveat that, you know, to infer recombination rates and hotspots across the whole genome would take 1,500 years. So that, that part hasn't changed. Yeah, given your computation time, you're not going to like this, but you really need to compute RC curves. Yes. <laughs> um, we've done that, and I'm not showing them. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. You can, you can interpret whatever you want from that. <laughs> um, Another depressing thing is that these <laughs> simulations were idealized. Um, and so there, there are other sources of error that we are not accounting for. So that would include, so once you go out of dealing with humans, you have assembly errors. You have genotyping errors because you're generally not dealing with extremely high coverage data. And you don't have haplotype phase. Okay. Is, is infer low full likelihood? It's, it has a version that's full likelihood. Presumably not the one that's giving a worse answer than summary. Uh, the version we used is, a, is, is sort of a composite likelihood implementation where you do full likelihood on small regions. Uh, does it do worse? Well, I mean, we've, we've played with the, I mean, the power is a function of like some arbitrary parameter that I can't change in their program, and it influences both the false positive rate and the power. So it actually may have, if you, if you tinkered with the parameters so that it had the same false positive rate, it may have a higher power. I suspect it does, but um, I haven't actually been able to get them to help me tinker with the code, and I haven't done it myself. Okay, so here, so 
as I was saying, this is this is the scenario that we'll never actually have because we don't have that kind of data. Okay, so so if you think that those are low, well, that's under the ideal scenario. Um, here we have sort of sources of error that we need to deal with, and I'll talk about how to deal with a couple of them. So we're going to deal with genotyping errors just by throwing out rare sites. So so this is sort of coming back to why we were hoping that you could just eliminate sites that um, have a minor allele frequency less than 5%. Um, and then we, we took the strategy that LD Hot did of, of, well, I mean, that the PanMap paper did by taking the genotype data and computationally phasing it and then using LD Hot on those, uh, you know, on those inferred haplotypes. Here's the power that you get. Um, you know, it kind of looks like the last one, except that the y-axis has changed. So all the powers are lower. Um, you know, so in the previous version, you know, these green bars went from like 16% up to 40-something percent. And now they're like 5 to 20-something percent. Um, so roughly speaking, um, when you don't have haplotyplic phase, the power is sort of halved, roughly. Okay. Uh, and then, so so those simulations differed in some way with um, the the actual method used in in, in the Otten et al. chimp paper. So then we we tried to see well if we change um, sort of the filtering steps to to as closely as we can um, mimic what they did to try and see sort of what the power would be in the in the false positive rate. So so we took ten individuals, we computationally phased them. We assume that the true situation was you have this high background rate, although the results are similar for other background rates, and a mixture of 10-fold, 20-fold, and 50-fold hotspots. And we, we took the two filters that they used. One is eliminating hotspots that were too large, and the other is sort of cross-referencing with LD hat. So this is what you were talking about. And eliminating hotspots identified by LD hot that don't have a peak recombination rate of at least 0 0.005 per base pair using LD hat. LD hat being the, the general method for estimating rates, LD hot the, the hotspot one. Okay, so this is what LD hat estimates look like. Um, it's partly because your sample size is 10 individuals and partly because you have to computationally phase it. This is what, you know, it's not great. These are where the actual hotspots are in the simulated data. And you squint your eyes, you can kind of see I don't know, there's sort of peaks in general over there, but there are lots of other peaks that show up. Um, sort of, uh, so our simulations sort of found a density of hotspots similar to what, um, what the PanMap people did, and we estimate at least under these assumptions that the power is roughly 8%, and the false discovery rate is, is very high, over 80%. Um, and even if we take a lower background rate, we get a false discovery rate that's, that's always well over 50%. Um, so, so what that means, I don't know, this is why we've had some trouble analyzing data. If you, if you go back to, to the A panel of this figure, um, so if you chose random regions throughout the genome, you would get the same thing. Um, and, and the reason why is because the, the process by which you choose them is that you you eliminate regions that don't have a peak rate that's at least, you know, 0 0.005 per base pair. Okay, so you're you're requiring that regions are above five, and if you just choose random ones, you, you will get a peak here and a flat line for humans. Okay. What we don't know is whether there's actually a very small bump on this red line here. Now, you can squint your eyes and say, uh, I don't know, does it kind of move up a little bit? The, the reason why that's interesting is, okay, we're sure that, that the vast majority of hotspots are not shared between humans and chimps. And, and there's many reasons for thinking that. But I think it's still an open question of whether there are some hotspots shared between humans and chimps. And the problem is, is that this red line here, okay, first off is going to be a mixture of of true hotspots and, you know, uh, well, I mean, I guess what I would say is when your false discovery rate is very high, then what you don't know is 
OK, maybe I'll phrase this a different way. This red line here is a mixture of potentially true hot spots and potentially many, many more true cold spots. Um, and so finding out whether, let's say, a few percent of hot spots are shared between species is actually pretty difficult. OK, so that's about all I have to say. Um, Might be right that there's a much higher positive rate in chimp, but there are some results that suggest that at least lots of the places that recombination detected in chimp might be real, like the GC signal. Uh huh. If you see what I mean, like if you look at the amalgam of the evidence, so I think Gil, you probably remember better than I will, but the signal for like bias towards GC bases at sites identified yeah. as hotspots in chimp isn't so much weaker than the equivalent signal for human hotspots, right? No, it's, I mean, it is weaker, but it's, it's certainly there. It's not, it's not quite so as well. Like so it could be that it's a more effective process on the chip lineage, for example. Mm -hmm. And it certainly should be that there's a higher pulse positive rate than so humans, but it can't. Guess the like, question of the correlation at the 100 kb scale, which is already quite good between humans and chimps, and I'm yeah. trying to figure mm -hmm. out how the numbers that you report give us a really good correlation. So, okay, so those numbers are based on LD hat. And so if you look at this, well, I mean, yeah, it kind of looks like a mess, but it, if you average, then it looks pretty good. So um, <coughs> my sense is once you're averaging over 100 kb windows, you do a pretty good job. There aren't many hotspots in 100 kb. That's the thing, right? There's That's only correct. one or two hotspots yeah. in 100 kb. So, but those correlations are based on LD hat. So that's, that's a different question. How, how good is LD hat at estimating an average rate over 100 kb versus how good is LD hot at identifying a hotspot? But the hotspots were identified on the basis of peaks in LD hat. That's just a filtering step. They're not, they're, they're identified as a combination. I mean, the, the primary determinant is that it has a low p value when you compare to these null simulations. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, the other, I mean, the other larger question is, given that LD hat and LD hot are using the same composite likelihood, why is it that their results don't always seem to line up? Um, that's a separate question. Um, but, um, but anyway, I think my general sense that there are lots of different parameter values that we don't actually know. Um, but in general, I would say that at least the existing methods we have seem to have moderate to poor power to detect real recombination hotspots, at least in species besides humans. Um, when, when you have... Yeah, what's the big difference with humans? You don't have phase, and you have small sample sizes. I think those are the big differences. And, and, I mean, but the hat map map is really excellent. So the hat map map... How much worse is the Asian than the European That I don't know, but I assume it's pretty good. Well, I mean, the other thing is that phasing gets easier when you have more individuals. So it's sort of, it, it, it compounds, that it's sort of like when you don't have enough individuals, it, it, it's, uh, you can't phase well, and but even but if... Okay, but that's, yeah, I accept that, but like, if you just sort of, um, are you, but, but you, the, a lot of these critiques also apply to the human example. I don't know. Uh, I would assume that the human maps are mostly correct. Um, just because I think that once you increase the sample size large enough, then you do a lot better. Have you verified that? No. Um, it's, it's on the list, but it turns out it's very, very slow to simulate the sample sizes that are comparable for human studies. Even like hat map type sense? Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a background thing that we're trying to look at larger and larger sample sizes, but it'll take, you know. I mean, there's a diminishing return as you look at larger samples. So yeah, right. yeah. Less and less opportunity for no, I mean, I, I think that there's something there that, like, you know, it, uh, you know, I still think that the human results are probably quite accurate, but the simulation results may or may not, like, suggest that they should be accurate. And so there, there could be some some difference there that needs to be explained. Um, and I want to try and say that, you know, I, I've tried, there, there's a difference between simulating exactly what I think the thing that's closest to the truth is, 
which is not what I've done here, but simulating sort of a deliberately somewhat pessimistic case because, well, in part because previous simulations were overly optimistic. But, but sorry, sorry are, you're, you're claiming or suggesting a qualitative difference in terms of the quality of your results for humans and other species. And that's a very interesting suggestion, if that's true. And I don't know what your evidence for that is. You're, like, you're, making, you're saying with larger sample sizes or base data, we do better. But you haven't demonstrated that. So these critiques don't obviously apply equally or almost equally. That's true. But I mean, we get an improvement of 30% from sample size 10 to 18. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, so, I, I agree with that. I mean, the human maps have been very useful for a variety of purposes and matched up to some extent, a uh, good extent, in useful ways with the other maps for taking the rails. So, but that doesn't mean that they're right. So, okay, maybe the, the, the more um, honest answer is I don't really know. I have my suspicions. We're going to try and run some simulations, but they take a long time. And so, you know, we have to wait a couple months at least. So I think if you want to make your simulations more pessimistic, you could take into account the fact that every chimp has a different PRDM9 yes. variant. Because I think yeah. that's a much bigger I issue, could. actually, <laughs> than, yeah, yeah. because right now you're kind of you know, optimistically assuming that everybody shares the same hotspot, which is actually probably kind of true in humans, at least in some human populations. But in chimpanzees, as you as you know, it's very far from true. And so then we're actually trying to detect a mixture of hotspots. And you know, well, but I would argue that 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 you're always just you're you're estimating an average anyway. So so my I would argue that there's a there's a true population scale of recombination rate under a host of assumptions that hold for, let's say, the Western chimp population. And under that, can you identify any of them that may be hotspots? So I think what you're saying is that even with full data, there may be fewer LD-based hotspots than in humans because you know, the effect of PRDM9 is, is more spread out. I guess what I'm saying is that in, you know, you're 10-fold, 20-fold, 30-fold, et cetera, higher, the chimps are push towards the left relative to humans. Yes. And you're assuming yes. currently that they have the same lambda values or whatever you're calling that. That's true. Um, Just help you're right. making them look okay. even worse. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot Andy. of detail built into the simulations. That have you thought of just subsampling from the human data to show that things fall apart with smaller sample of human data? Um, yeah, so, so, I mean, so to a limited extent, um, the PanMap study did that, but it's very hard to figure out exactly how they did that. I think they, they took genotypes that were already called using imputation on a much larger sample. Um, so to do it for real, you would start with raw data, raw human data, and you would go through the same process. Well, if you want to be totally accurate, you, like, take the human genome and you, like, screw it up some so that it's like comparable in quality to the, to the, the chip genome. And then you go and you map the reads onto the screwed up one and, and do some snip calling um, and maybe imputation and then some phasing and then try and identify hotspots. So that would be the appropriate thing to do. Um, and we haven't done that yet. <laughs>